Um, the church uh, that we attended, Katie and I attended, before coming to Cedar Rock, uh, is, is a semi-large church in Wake Forest, and it sent dozens of missionaries around the world. And so right now there's probably you know 30 odd families around the world that uh, are members of North Wake, but are there as missionaries in various places. A few years ago, uh, my pastor at the time went on a trip to Asia to visit a lot of those missionaries. And so it was a two-week trip, and he stopped at various cities to visit these members of our church who were missionaries. And while he was in the city of Calcutta in India, he met a man named Aziz. And he said that Aziz used to be a Muslim. Now he's a believer in Jesus Christ. And Aziz pastors a church in Calcutta of Muslim background believers, people who used to be Muslims but now follow Jesus Christ. And Aziz used to have a long beard and wear some of the traditional Muslim garb. But Larry, the pastor, said that the five major Muslim newspapers in Calcutta had plastered his name and picture on the front page. And they encouraged people to find him and persecute him. So Aziz shaved his beard, changed his clothes, and he continues to pastor in this city, but knowing that any day he could be beaten to death for it. In our part of the world, we don't face opposition like this. Praise God. But what if we did? I don't have a crystal ball, and, and we can't always predict what the world will look like in 10, 20, or 30 years, but, but this question is an important one. Regardless of what that opposition looks like, what do we do when opposition comes? What do we do when opposition to our faith comes? We find an answer to this question in the book of Acts. We've been studying the book of Acts. Acts, of course, tells us how the church grew from a little small group of folks up in an upper room to this global community. And it, so far in the book of Acts, two things are happening. One, the mission of Christ is spreading. People are coming to believe the good news. But at the same time, it's as if we, they're cranking a dial. Persecution, opposition is intensifying for the church. And today we're going to read a passage about a time when that opposition became almost unbearable and what the church did in response. So Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out of the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. We begin this passage hearing about someone named Herod the king. And if you've read any of the Bible before, you know there's a lot of Herods in the New Testament. And so um, the, the, one of the Herods is Herod the Great. This was the Herod that killed the babies when Jesus was an infant. Another Herod was Herod Antipas. This is the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist when John the Baptist dared criticize him. This guy is another Herod, Herod Agrippa I. This is Herod the Great's grandson, Herod Antipas's nephew. And Herod Agrippa had, I think we could say, an interesting childhood. Historians tell us that Grandpa Herod the Great was not so great. Uh, Grandpa Herod the Great ended up actually killing... <laughs> Herod Agrippa's dad, because he was paranoid. He thought everybody was out to get him. So Herod Agrippa's mother, after, you know, 
Agrippa's dad gets whacked. You know, they, they moved to Rome to kind of get out of the heat. Uh, and Herod Agrippa then grew up in Rome. He grew up in these elite Roman circles. He went to school with the guy who would become emperor of the whole empire. And when that guy, Claudius, did become emperor over the Roman Empire, he named his buddy Herod Agrippa to be king over a huge swath of land, including Judea and Jerusalem. Now, what we know about Herod Agrippa from from historians is that Herod Agrippa, this guy, was a master politician. I mean, even though he was really a Roman elite, even though he wasn't actually a Jew, he was a descendant of Esau. Herod Agrippa went to really, really extreme lengths to please his constituents in Judea, the Jews. For example, his, one of the historian writes that he would uh, read, publicly read and quote the Old Testament scriptures, not, not because he believed them, but because the folks liked it. And for some reason, Herod Agrippa had it in for followers of Jesus. Maybe it was because he didn't like that there was this growing group of people who bowed their knee first to a different king. Or maybe it was simply a political calculation. The Jews were not so fond of the Christians. What better way to curry their favor than to bully the people they didn't like? So we see in verse 1, Herod the king, Herod Agrippa this is, laid violent hands on some who belong to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Y'all remember James? One of the apostles? The apostle John's brother, this guy who was a part of Jesus' inner circle with Peter and John, this James, Herod Agrippa, kills him with the sword, which probably means he beheaded him. And when he saw that this execution made folks happy, he decided to go after the head, to go after Peter. And he had Peter arrested. And of course, Passover was in session now, so they had to try, they had to wait until Passover passed to try and execute him too. So we see here with Herod Agrippa is that Opposition had come hard against the church. This wasn't a nobody likes me kind of opposition. This was the kind of opposition that our brother in Christ Aziz experiences right now in Calcutta. Herod Agrippa was trying to take out the church's leaders. And imagine how frightening this must have been for the everyday Christians in Jerusalem. I mean, how would you respond? If authorities came in here, took me off, whacked me, grabbed your Sunday school teacher, threw him in jail, and held him for execution. I mean, how would that affect your faith? Maybe we'd be tempted to run and hide. Maybe we'd be tempted to give up our faith. Maybe we'd be tempted to, you know, grab up arms and march against them. Look what the church did in verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but... Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. These folks in Jerusalem didn't give up on their faith. They didn't get swords and torches and mount a rebellion. They grabbed their most powerful weapon in an even more rebellious act. They gathered together and prayed. When we hear this, Most of us are kind of let down. This sounds kind of anticlimactic. Getting together and praying doesn't sound like much of anything. It sounds kind of vanilla, lethargic, inactive. But perhaps we think this way because we don't understand what prayer is. Prayer, when we we pray, think about it. The almighty God of the universe, the one who spoke a word and the universe popped into existence, the one who who wove you together in your mother's womb, the one who holds it all together, this God beckons us to commune with Him. He invites us into His presence. He yearns for us to bring our little 
burdens to him. We have no business uttering his name, much less speaking to him, but he invites us to talk to him. Prayer is not the weakest weapon in our arsenal. It is the strongest because in prayer, we acknowledge the truth. We don't have control over anything. God does. And in prayer, we collectively go to the one who does have control over these things. John Piper says this about prayer and about what prayer really is. He says, life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always that. Our weakness in prayer is owing largely to our neglect of this truth. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in the world. See, when opposition comes, we pray. When's the last time you simply paused and prayed? Not just a blessing. Not just a, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. When was the the last time you paused? And you said, God, you are marvelous. God, I praise you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. Forgive me of my sins. And God, I bring my burdens to you. When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you gathered with your church to pray? I mean, every time we see the church in the book of Acts, they're praying. In Acts 1, when they chose a new disciple, they were devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 2, the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship of the breaking of bread and the prayers. In Acts 4, the church prayed for boldness. In Acts 6, the apostles devoted themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Here, the church devotes themselves to prayer. Throughout Acts, the church individually The church corporately devotes themselves to prayer. Why not us? Why not collectively grab hold of our wartime walkie-talkie God has given us as we collectively plead with God the Father? When opposition comes, we could have the sharpest swords and the brightest torches, but if we have not prayer, they're all pointless. When opposition comes, we pray. That's the first thing we see when opposition comes. Secondly, when opposition comes, we trust Christ. We trust Christ. Now acknowledge this is a bleak topic and a bleak story, but wedged in the middle of this bleak topic, bleak story, is ironically one of the most lighthearted prison break stories you'll ever read. Um... So we're going to look at that, look at that now. So look, look at verse 6 together. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. All right, so Peter is arrested. He's got four squads of soldiers defending him, guarding him. He's bound up with two chains. Sentries are posted at the door. He is facing a trial, likely an execution the next day. And what's Peter doing? What's he doing? Sleeping. Think about that. Uh, if, if this were me and this set of circumstances, I don't think my first inclination would be to sleep. I'd be up pacing around, wondering what's going to happen. You know, I would not be sleeping. But I think Peter knew What many of you who have faced hardships have told me that you have learned. And it's this. This is a direct quote from multiple people in this room. Whatever happens, I win. I think Peter knew that. Peter trusted Christ. Peter trusted that Jesus Christ had died and risen again for him. Peter had been forgiven of his sins. Peter knew that no matter what happened the next day, 
he would be with Jesus Christ. Peter trusted Christ and that gave him comfort in the face of a very uncomfortable situation. And so Peter, Peter slept. Pretty remarkable. Verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Picture it. You know, Peter's sleeping. An angel shows up in the room. Light, the room lights up. You know, you can imagine the angel doing his ta-da. You know, I'm here. And Peter keeps sleeping, right? So the angel has to jab him in the side to wake him up. And Peter finally wakes up. And the guy says, let's go. we got to go. Verse 8. And the angel said to him, dress yourself. Put on your sandal. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and all that the Jewish people were expecting. So the angel here miraculously leads Peter to freedom. And this is the easiest prison break in the history of prison breaks. There has never been an easier one. And then only when Peter is out in the middle of Jerusalem, an escaped convict, Jerusalem's most wanted, does he realize, hey, this was for real. You know, this wasn't a vision. I'm actually out. Continue verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. All right, so Peter, understanding that he better get somewhere fast, doesn't want to get captured again, He runs to this house of Mary, mother of John Mark. We're going to hear more about John Mark soon. But a handful of folks are gathered in Mary's house, and they're praying for Peter. Peter knocks on the door. Okay, servant girl Rhoda comes over. Uh, You know, she hears that Peter's out there, and what, you know, you would expect she'd open the door, right? But she's so excited, she forgets and turns around and goes, tells the folks, hey, Peter's out here. Um, So we continue, verse 15. They said to her, right, Rhoda comes in and says, hey, it's Peter. They said to her, you are out of your mind. (laughs) They've been praying that Peter would be released, and he does, and they don't believe it. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, well, it's his angel, right? That's more believable, right, that his angel's at the door knocking. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought about brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James, obviously different James. One James is dead. This is James, brother of Jesus, and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. All right, so it seems to me it was easier for Peter to get out of prison than it was to get into Mary's house. You know, uh, he was having difficulty there. But as humorous as all of this was, let me ask you something. Did Peter do anything to get out of prison? No. Uh, It would have been humanly impossible for Peter to break out of prison given those situations and circumstances he was in. Who was the one that got him out of prison ultimately? God, right? Peter trusted Christ. Peter knew if it was God's will, he'd be free. Peter knew if he died like James, though, that he would soon be in the presence of his Savior. Peter was in a no-lose scenario. How many of you remember, uh, if you're my age or maybe a little, how many of y'all remember the, the Choose Your Own Adventure books? You might know what that is. Okay, Terry had some books. Did you, y'all have any Choose Your Own Adventure books? Okay, I had a, for those of you who don't know, Choose Your Own Adventure books is where you start reading and at the end of a chapter it gives you a choice. For example, I had a Choose Your Own Adventure book about like a mystery is set in an abandoned circus, which was kind of creepy, right? And at the end of a chapter, it said, you know, if you want to 
go down the slide, turn to page 42. Uh, if you want to open the creepy looking box, turn to page 18, right? And you had a choice to make. You could choose your own adventure in the book. Uh, now, I must have had a pretty depressing book because no matter what I did, things always ended poorly for me in this book. I never actually got to the end of the book. Everything always ended badly to have to start all over again, right? Uh, I was in a no-win situation, right? This is the opposite of that. Peter was not in a no-win situation. He was in a no-lose situation. If we trust in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens, we win. Whether God delivers us, whether he doesn't, we win. We get to be with Jesus. And I say this because I know that when opposition comes, when illness arises, when relationships sever or friendships are broken, we can feel pretty hopeless. But Christ is our hope in life or in death. Do you have that kind of hope? Do you have the kind of hope that would allow you to sleep soundly in a prison cell the night before an execution? Do you have the kind of faith that if it's God's will, you know he can get you through any situation if it's his will? Listen, Jesus Christ offers us that kind of hope when we trust in him. Which is why when opposition comes, we trust in Christ. Third thing. When opposition comes, we allow God to be judge. Look at verse 18. Now when day, now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Right? So Herod was not happy that they couldn't find Peter. Peter had escaped. So Herod, in his anger, kills the soldiers instead. The ones who should have been guarding him, they're gone. And then Herod leaves and he goes north to Caesarea. Then verse 20, Now when Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, which is a cool name, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down. Because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. All right, so we see here is Herod goes north and he does some political jostling with the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon. One day he, he gets up to give a speech. It says, verse 21, he put on his royal robes. There's a historian named Josephus who recounts this same story. And this is, listen to what Josephus said about Herod's royal robes. He says, uh, Herod was clad in a garment woven completely of silver so that its texture was indeed wondrous. He entered the theater at, bre at daybreak. There the silver, illumined by the touch of the first rays of the sun, was wondrously radiant, and by its glitter inspired fear and awe in those who gazed intently upon it. Sounds like Herod should be going to Broadway. I mean, this is a, a gaudy-looking silver thing he's wearing. And Herod, draped in this gaudy silver-looking thing, comes and delivers a beautiful speech. The crowd goes wild. They shower him with praise and flattery. They say, the voice of a god. And not of a man. And Herod soaks it all in. Doesn't bother to correct him. He says, yeah, maybe I am kind of like a God and not a man. 
For God, this is the final straw for Herod. It says, verse 23, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. It's kind of ironic. Just as an angel struck Peter and woke him up, this angel strikes Herod and brings him down. And again, Josephus corroborates this whole event. He says that while he was speaking, Herod felt a sharp pain in his side and five days later was dead. And so we think perhaps maybe God orchestrated things so there was an intestinal parasite that killed Herod from the inside out. Herod opposed God. What happened to Herod? He was dead. But, verse 24, the Word of God increased and multiplied. Now, we think about this with Herod. Think about how much anger the church must have felt towards Herod before all this happened. Right? If they'd done nothing wrong, Herod wanted them gone, one of their leaders gone. If this were us, we would want to get back. But here, Luke reminds us, God is judge. God knows when wrong and injustice are committed. God sees every act of self-serving hypocrisy, and God will bring judgment at the proper time. Either in this life, as with Herod, or in the next God says in Deuteronomy 32-35, Vengeance is mine. And when we understand this truth that God is judge, God will deal with injustice, this frees us up from the desire to, to get back at somebody. Or from the bitterness that happens when we can't get back at somebody because we know God is judge. Let me just bring this notion that God is judged to to bear in a particular aspect of our lives. Um, some of you know this conversation about wrong and evil doing is, is not theoretical because you or someone you love has been deeply hurt by someone else's sin. Maybe this person's actions are private and the only people who know are you, God, and that person. And so just to say, if you have suffered evil at the hands of another person, physical, sexual, emotional abuse at the hands of another person, you may feel hopeless. You may feel bitter that this person just got away with it. Listen closely. God knows. And God is judge. God will deal with people's wickedness, either in this life or in the next, and apart from the grace of Christ, they will face the holy wrath of God. This means God is not blind to your suffering, whatever it is. God is not absent and distant from whatever it is you've gone through. God loves you dearly. And He will deal with that person's wickedness. When opposition comes, we remember God is judge. But by this same token, we have to realize that every single one of us stands under God's holy wrath too. Every single one of us is more like Herod than we would dare believe. We are guilty before God of sin and idolatry. And since God is judge, one day He must and will judge us for our sins. And church, this is why He sent Jesus Christ. This is why He redeemed a people called the church. We've been reading about in Acts because our only hope to be spared of the wrath that we see Herod receive here is to repent of those sins and believe in Christ. That's it. And so if you have never repented of your sins and believed in Christ, God's Word says you stand under His wrath. And every passing second is another opportunity, another chance to repent, to get right with Jesus, to have the hope that can take you through 
uh, the situations like we see here. To be spared the wrath of God. Because one day, as with Herod, time's up. One day, the, the patience of God is, is done. And, and there are no more chances. If you have never repented in, of your sins and believed in Jesus Christ, will you today, before you leave, before get right with God today, before you face what Herod faced for his sins? Church, opposition will come. Scripture promises us this is true. People like Aziz experience this opposition right now. Perhaps one day we will too. But when opposition comes... We don't fight with swords. We fight with prayer. We don't trust in princes. We trust in Jesus Christ. We don't make ourselves little J judges. We trust the one true capital J judge. And we do this with confidence. Because despite all the opposition the church faced through Herod, Herod ended up dead, but the word of God increased. And multiply. We have the promise that nothing can stop the ever marching, ever spreading, powerful, transformative word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we know when opposition comes, God is in control. Would you pray with me? Father, most of us don't like to think about opposition. We don't want to think about what would happen should we face a life or death situation for our faith. God, but when those help, help us to decide now that today we will plan to face that opposition with prayer, with trust in Christ, and resting in the fact that you, God, are judge. And God, I pray if there's anyone here who has never accepted Jesus Christ, never repented of their sins, never um, been spared the wrath of God, help them to see very clearly that a life without repentance, a life without trusting in Christ will lead to God's wrath and judgment in hell. But God, help them to see that you sent your Son for them. I pray that right now, wherever they are, they would say, God, I am a sinner. I turn from that sin, and I believe Jesus died for me. And help them to see that, that when they trust in Christ, that there is forgiveness of sins. There is hope for eternity, God. I pray you give them the boldness to see that this is just but the first step in embarking on the Christian life, and embarking on a life and a journey with the church. God, if there's anyone here who, who, who needs to wrestle with this, that today they'd come talk to me or someone about what it means to follow Jesus Christ, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.